Hi guys, I'm Big Mike, and like always, I'd like to thank you for being here today. Today we welcome back Linda Bradford Raschke. This is her third presentation on BMT, and this is part of our special five-year anniversary. Uh, today, Linda is going to be talking about good trading habits, and we're also going to give away 10 autographed copies of a book that Linda selected uh, that aligns with this topic. And the, uh, the book is by Charles Duhigg, and the title of the book uh, escapes me is The Power of Habit. That's what it is, The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. So uh, I'm going to ask that you have your BMT username ready to go. So if you're one of the winners of the 10 autographed books, I will ask for your username, and that way you can give it to me quickly, and then I'll contact you after the webinar is over to ask uh, what autograph you would like for Linda to make, make it out and uh, get your mailing address and everything to get those books in your hands. The webinar is being recorded like always. I'll post the recording on YouTube sometime tomorrow. If you are watching the recording at a later date and you like it, do me a favor and give us a thumbs up. Uh, also, I want to mention that you can find Linda on her website at lbrgroup.com. As you guys have questions, you can go ahead and start typing in them in the question box, and uh, I'm sure Linda will do her best to try to get people's questions answered here today. Okay, with that, I am turning things over to Linda right now. Okay, Linda, you should have the option to show your screen, and now we've got it. So good afternoon, gang. Can everybody see my screen and can everybody hear me okay? Hey, Linda. Or am I talking too loud? No, it's good. We got it. We got both. Thanks. Both are thumbs up? Thumbs up. All right. I have to warn you guys, you know, it's been a busy, crazy, crazy week. And uh, just to give you a heads up, the only way I manage to uh, do these things and stay focused is to, like, have God knows how much caffeine. I don't normally drink a lot of coffee, but, to, like, you know, get that extra little second wind here. Uh, I've had about three cups, uh, actually a Diet Coke, if I have to be frank. So uh, uh, just put with me if I get a little talking too fast here. Uh, always a pleasure to speak to you guys. I so appreciate the time and the work and energy that Big Mike does to put these things together. And what you have to understand is the reason that I do something like this for you guys is because it's always an exercise for myself. All right? Anytime I'm going to make a presentation on technicals or on a market system or anything in life, it always gives me the opportunity to put together a little project or thesis for myself. So everything that I speak to you is coming from a very, very personal view. And uh, I, you know, I, I've, I've lived through all of this with you. And what I try to do is select something that's going to be most helpful to you, yes, of course, but also most helpful to me. So just a little note of departure about how this particular topic came up which is systems, okay? All kinds of systems, from technical systems to systems of behavior. And just to give you a little sneak, uh, sneak um, background here, I was uh, in the airport to uh, fly down to uh, another state, and usually I pick up murder mystery books, but in this case I walked over to the bookstore and was looking at, well, what is on the top 10 bestseller list by the New York Times? And there was a book that was number two on the list called Power of Habit. So I thought, hmm, that sounds like an interesting read. So I read that down on the airplane down in Florida and was reading it down there. And it really made an impression. In particular, this book made such a strong impression because of the research and the science behind it. And it started out with an expose about the physical and neurological and chemical changes in the brain when somebody is able to change their behaviors or habits. And one of the prime examples they used was studying the brain of a person who had been previously an alcoholic. Well, many of you may be well aware that drugs and alcohol are probably one of the most challenging habits out there to change. All right, I'm going to use that word change because we always put the onus on us to eliminate bad habits, but much research points out that habits actually serve a legitimate function, 
And we're going to go into this when we start to examine our trading and some of the behaviors during the day. So habits such as alcoholism are very difficult to modify or change or replace. But this was a very, very optimistic book because it gave example after example after example of numerous alcoholics that have been through the AA program and have been sober or dry for 10, 15, 20 years. And I'll tell you, my stepfather is, a, uh, is an alcoholic who's been dry for 30 years now. Thought never crosses his brain. It's just part of his lifestyle never to even think about it. And that's been 30 years. So it was really interesting that the uh, research showed the way that the brain built new pathways and um, how it modified over time as the new habits, the positive habits, got reinforced over and over and over. So that was impression one that struck me from the book. And then number two, I always like to go back and um, uh, read technical books from the past. And uh, I was reading some of, uh, of Gartley's original book. And over and over, there was this word that kept on popping up in his writing, systematic, 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 and the power of systems, the ways that they helped in trading. And, uh, you know, it's really quite interesting if you go back and you read the literature of these people that wrote books 100 years ago, really there's so much psychology that they wrote about behind, uh, you know, between the lines. So that was number two. And then... And number three, I started Googling more things on the internet, just doing different research, and I came up with this wonderful site that I'll share with you at the end called Everyday Systems, which also provided more tools. So these three uh, pieces of random uh, uh, intervention here from the universe, uh, this power of habit book, the words from Gartley, and uh, then this particular website sort of form, formed the backbone of what I'm going to talk about to you today. So uh, let me just scroll past uh, this a little bit here. Page down, page down, page down. Okay. Um, so I'm going to take you through a little bit of a foundation and then we're going to progress and evolve and hopefully my goal is to show you just how much more important it is to have these systems of behavior and systems for changing habits in our work as professionals and tra traders, how much more of an impact that will ultimately make to your bottom line. And God knows, I can't tell you how much money I have seen uh, for people um, spending money on coaches, trading coaches, uh, psychologists, oh my goodness, a zillion tools under the sun, but let me ask you in the long run, have any of them made a significant and permanent change in your behaviors or habits? And I would venture to guess that maybe 2% of you out there have been able to significantly change or eradicate a habit in your trading that is somehow, some way holding you back. Now the good news is, there's always good news, that if you are newer to trading, all right, if you're newer to trading, you have all the benefit here of not having developed and imprinted bad habits in your uh, profession. If you are older, you will find that it's going to be harder to eradicate habits just because you may have repeated a particular behavior multiple times. Okay, so this is one of the few times where it's actually good news if you're newer to this uh, business of trading. Let me show you, though, this wonderful little indicator up here on this slide. Now, this is why I go back and I love reading these books like uh, Gartley or Wyckoff or anybody from the past because I always walk away with something unique, some little tidbit that can make a little difference or at least induce us to do some research. So if you stick around, and I promise I won't keep it too long today because everybody's probably burned out after the last two, three trading days, I promise I'm going to disclose to you what this neat little indicator is. It's pretty, pretty intriguing, isn't it, huh? So this is going to be, uh, I know that Mike likes to promise books, but I'm not sure which is a more powerful motivator, you know, a book or an indicator. <laughs> it's always fun to play with. 
So anyway, this was taken last night, and you can, can see what uh, the market did today. All right. So this was from Gartley, and uh, again, my goal was to integrate all of this in one little neat package for you, uh, technical systems, indicators, and systems for behavior. Now number two, okay, you want a nice little mechanical system, voila, here is one of my best. See, I have no problem disclosing everything to you, every indicator, every system, everything under the sun, because I can guarantee that 99% of you are not going to be able to do them because you need to do the research for yourself. You can only trade making your own decisions, and I'll read some more things from Gartley later that substantiate this. But this right here, if you want a system, voila, this is one of my best performing systems. So simple, easy breezy, so forth and so forth. Now just to give you a teeny bit of background, I started off on the options floor as a market maker and uh, did uh, options arbitrage for a number of years. Uh, that means that we were uh, <clears throat> looking for uh, pieces of data that had uh, short-term aberration or were out of line where there was a statistical edge, <clears throat> such as <clears throat> calendars or butterflies or certain spreads and so forth uh, that you could put on a little hedge. Nowadays, of course, you know that everything is right in line and there is no edge to trading options anymore. They are just a way of more or less making a directional bet with limited risk. So it's not the game that it used to be. But this is how my mind was trained, that you go in on very selective data points all right, and make a, uh, a, a, uh, a short-term trade or even a longer term trade, but it's there because there is a certain unique opportunity. So then when I evolved into futures trading, okay, I went with this same approach, and I think that's uh, what basically uh, contributed to my success, was seeing everything in terms of short term, little catchy systems or trades. And one of the things that's a challenge for people in the markets is, is that, you know, you try to predict the technical outcome all the time, which is really impossible. In fact, Gartley says one of the uh, biggest things, the traits that a trader must have is the ability to stay on the sidelines, all right, to stay on the sidelines when there is nothing going on. And I think that in the long run, patience is a big part of this. So when I started trading the futures, everything became in terms of little goofy plays. And I'm sure that you saw some of that from the Street Smarts book. The, the, there's a little anti-pattern or, or the turtle soup play, you know, which is the, the way that the market tests or trades around the previous 20-day highs or lows. For example, today in the euro currency, we had a test below the 20-day low and came back up above it. And likewise with the Russell futures, we tested below that well-watched pivot point and came back up above it. So it makes a striking impression that there's just a little play around these points. Okay, it's not a mechanical system. So when I refer to systems, all right, it's just a short-term little opportunity in the data there. And how you manage it and manage your risk and all is a whole nother ball of wax. So anyway, this was the way that uh, my uh, mind began to think uh, early on. So let me just progress down uh, to the next slide now that I've showed you technical indicators and technical systems. To summarize some of the things with Gartley's writings when I was reading him, I just want you to notice that every little tidbit that I was reading okay, is involving the word systematic. All right, so system does not need to uh, imply a mechanical system, all right, but you are doing everything in a repeatable, methodical fashion, all right. The difference between losses and profits hinges upon trading in a hit or miss fashion or systemizing, systematizing one's speculation, okay. Another common thing, successful traders do their own thinking, okay, and study the market conditions for themselves. Uh, the importance of being systematic, and I thought this was a particularly pertinent point, 
is that it permits you to be patient, waiting for that one opportunity, for that one little pattern where you have high edge to set up. Okay, so forget about if you're missing the swing down or missing the swing up, there's all always going to be a spot that favors your play, be it a continuation pattern or a loss of momentum such as we have at the lows today when the Dow made a lower low and the S&P and Russell made a higher low type of thing. You will always find your one spot. All you need to do is make one trade a day. So systematic, systematic, systematic allows you to be patient. And uh, all these things you'll see start to synchronize together because when we start to examine our bad habits that are holding us back, you know, there's probably a list of 10 common ones and I guarantee that every one of us, myself included, is going to err on, on two or three of them. A lot of them have to do with controlling emotion such as frustration or boredom. I have a good friend online who trades the Boons. He's over in Switzerland. Fabulous, fabulous technical person. And sometimes uh, we were talking about today, I was asking him, what are your bad habits? And he goes, sometimes, you know, I just get bored, you know, and frustrated and whatever. And that's when you'll go in and make an emotional trade, even though you know that there's no technical edge to it. All right. So lots of issues can come up uh, that evolve from emotions and uh, I'm just the tip of the iceberg. I'm not going to elaborate on that here. Okay, so just to sum up, so far people see systems in terms of technicals and mechanical trades. We're going to look for systems, though, that allow us to change our behavior or our habits because, as you well know, this is probably one of the hardest things in the world to do, especially as one gets older. You've repeated the bad pattern so many times, it's darn near impossible to undo. But have hope. You have to believe. There's millions of examples of people that have done it. Kicked a drug addiction, beat gambling, you know, uh, beat uh, alcoholism, everything under the sun. So it's absolutely possible and probable that you can change your behavior as well without paying a fortune to a trading coach. All right. So now you've hit the nail on the head. This is what this seminar is really about, eliminating bad habits. I thought that was pretty funny. Okay. So some of the more common ones, uh, emotional trades, you see this, everybody has one of them, uh, not pulling the trigger or following your plan, not having a plan, blowing off after hours uh, your preparation or homework. Uh, listening to other people's opinions, not staying out of the market when you're confused, probably one of the most biggest challenges nowadays, allowing distractions, could be surfing the internet and email, talking on the phone, running around doing errands, concentration is a big name of the game. Now the idea here is to have our habits become semi-automatic because when the shit hits the fan and the market action gets crazy, that's when habits are going to take over. All right? So you need them. You need good habits to protect yourself. I know that everybody knows this stuff. I'm not saying anything new to you guys, but I'm going to give you some structure that you can put it to work, okay? Because, you know, if you, you, there's no such thing as your future self. All right, you are who you are right now. You can say, oh, I'm going to go on a diet. Oh, I'm going to go change this. Oh, when I get organized, I'm going to be a profitable trader. T -t 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 -t. Whatever you are now is what you are in the future. In other words, you need to be right now, okay? Not you're going to start your diet tomorrow. Not you're going to change your sloppy behavior tomorrow. Not you're going to start your record keeping tomorrow. You need to be who you are right now. That's the same person that you're going to be a week from now, a month from now, etc. Okay? So uh, I just thought this was a funny little aside. Everybody likes to find excuses, right? Lack of accountability. And, uh, uh, and this is what happens when you keep on making excuses. Uh, have you ever felt like this? You know, uh, making sloppy, impulsive trades during the day? Just feeding little chips into the machine, okay? Uh, we don't want to do that with real dollars, and I'm sure uh, that nobody intends to do this, all right? Nobody intends to do this, 
we all study the technicals and our, and our, uh, our systems and so forth. Uh, but what's going to keep you from trading that breakout of the three bar coil that I showed you? And I'll give you all the parameters for this stuff at the end. Uh, like I said, it's, uh, there's no secrets in the market in my book. Okay, there's only, uh, only sloppiness, all right? So <laughs> it's the impulse trades and the unforced errors that are going to hold you back. So let's, uh, let's, let's nip this in the bud. Now, this book I highly recommend to you. I'm going to give it away at the end of this. It's very inexpensive. You know, I'm a big believer in all those books that only cost uh, $20 or so. The Power of Habit. And uh, you can Google on the Internet and find... Uh, numerous uh, things along this line, all right, Charles Duhigg, uh, but it, it always astounds me, like how, uh, how many times I do things where I don't even realize that I'm doing. The thing that struck me in this book was he said that 70% of our actions during the day are not of our own conscious choice or free will, they're just governed by our behavior. And there's a part of the brain that is so powerful, uh, I don't know all the uh, multi-syllable um, uh, uh, words here, but let me just give you an interesting example. Uh, there was a fellow who was in an accident, and the only way that they could uh, salvage his uh, brain concussion or whatever was basically to do a, a quasi-lobotomy on him, sad to say. So um, they, uh, they did, and afterwards he was... Um, calm and uh, functional, but he lost all of his short-term memory. He lost all of his memory to the point where uh, they could ask him, where is the kitchen, when he was sitting in his living room, and he could have no idea. They'd ask him, well, where is the cupboard in the kitchen? Where do you get the cup? Couldn't tell you, no memory whatsoever, but yet, then he could get up, walk to the kitchen, go to the cupboard, take a cup down, give himself a glass of water, and go back into the living room and sit down in front of the TV. How could this be if he had no memory? Same thing, he could go out the front door, go for a walk around the block, and come back home. But the minute he walked out the front door, somebody could ask him, where is your house? It could be 20 feet behind him, but he had no idea. He had zero memory, a very, very unique phenomena. But they found this part of the brain, okay, that is basically habit-driven, these repeatable behaviors that you just repeat regardless of whether you have any memory or not. You see? So that's how powerful these things are that have a grip on us. And, and to make matters worse, there's other things in the brain uh, that uh, create dopamine when we do uh, pleasurable things, uh, so, such as some bad habits like procrastination or overeating or whatever. Uh, same thing with a gambler uh, or pulling the trigger too many times. There's a chemical that activates the brain's reward center. So you've got that dopamine uh, plug encouraging us to do certain actions over and over and over again. So it's a big challenge fighting all these things. I can't tell you how many times, uh, you know, when I've, uh, quote, been modifying my eating behavior, right? And uh, I didn't mean to eat that cookie that was sitting there on the counter. I don't even remember eating that cookie on the counter. But, wow, it's gone. Where did it go? I'm sure some of you have had those experiences, too. As an aside, I didn't pull up the cartoon that we had from a couple years ago, but very cute. It was a correlating... Uh, the, the box of cookies with the uh, market's boredom. So in other words, the, the slower the market activity was, the faster that box of cookies got eaten. I'll have to save that one for another time. But I know all of you know exactly what I'm talking about, how many of our behaviors are semi-automatic, and I really feel at this point in the game, for most of you online with me, you have heard enough seminars and webinars and stuff dealing with technicals, all right? Your job now is to decipher what works for you, extract it down to just a few systems, because you can't trade every market, every system, every pattern, every time frame, so forth and so forth, all right? What you need to do is narrow it down to three or five, get some record keeping going so that you make sure that you're not doing these trades that are outside your system, 
And then once you have your actual technical or mechanical systems in place, and if you want, I'll give you a summary of some of mine at the end of this, uh, uh, such as that three bar, or some short-term S&P systems. Once you have those in place, then you need to work on systems for your behaviors that are either keeping you from making trades outside of your particular program, okay, or are, are, are causing you to not pull the trigger uh, for your particular program or deviate from it. So that's where we're going to go with this uh, webinar, all right? Uh, I promise I'm not going to take too much more time because uh, I want to have plenty of time for questions and, and I know that you'll get my main point, all right? Now we know this stuff is bad for us, we know we're doing it, blah, 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 but it's not changing and we want to change that. All right, so here's a little summary Okay, just, uh, and you can read a zillion books on this habit, so I'm not going to belabor it. There's people that are exports better than I. But here's a little summary about the hierarchy that leads to behaviors, and behaviors are habits. Beliefs, it all starts with beliefs. So your beliefs are something that are not rational or logical, they're just part of you, okay, right or wrong. A lot of people have belief systems that you may not agree with, so it's uh, you know, it, it, it's not a black or white type of thing. Uh, and you may have the belief, uh, let's see, these are, these have nothing to our, uh, I don't know what that uh, previous slide was there uh, after belief. I'll have to clean that up a little bit. Uh, but beliefs, nothing that's black or white, it's just what you are. Those beliefs are going to govern your attitudes, okay? So, for example, politics. If you believe a certain way, it's going to affect your attitudes, okay, about people out there in certain political uh, 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 venues and so forth and so forth. And that's going to generate feelings, all right? And from your feelings, feelings drive your actions. Just like when you're about to make a trade, you must have a powerful enough feeling that's going to cause you to pull the trigger. All right, unless it's one of these impulsive reactions. But usually you must be stalking something or have a strong enough feeling, okay, to go ahead and risk money. Once you've repeated that action multiple times, that leads to habit. So that's the big hierarchy of how these things are built and how they progress. You know, and so much of what we hear is, oh, you know, positive self-talk, that little uh, devil and angel on your shoulders. That's just a very small part of it, okay? It's very important because it's that self-talk that is going to brainwash you into changing your beliefs. So, for example, do you believe that you can be a good enough trader that you could manage a million dollars and make 25% a year? Do you believe that? Or are you secretly doubting yourself or sabotaging yourself or, or don't have the confidence, okay? If you don't believe it, that's okay because if we lie to ourselves, this is what Tony Robbins was all about and goodness knows he made billions of dollars preaching this. If we lie to ourselves, the brain doesn't know the difference if you're telling it the truth or you're telling it a lie, okay? Brain doesn't care. If you tell yourself it, even if you know in your heart that it's not true or you don't believe it, if you tell yourself it enough, you will believe it. And that's what you got to do. You've got to program the subconscious. All right. See? So I thought this was a cute little aside here, a little moment here. Uh, everybody, everybody needs uh, that little, uh, little uh, voice saying that they believe in themselves. And, and if you don't, just lie and tell yourself that you do, okay? But this is still not where we're going to go. This is just a very small part of the equation because what happens, all right? I know all you guys have known this. You, you're good in your trading for a month. You're good on your diet for a month, whatever, okay? What happens when you're under severe stress? What happens when you don't get enough sleep? What happens when you're making a move or getting a divorce or any type of extra stress on the mind or the body? All the habits fall to pieces again. That's what happens with alcoholics or binge dieters or smokers or whatever. It just takes that one little break in the dam where they relapse and they're back to using drugs or whatever the case may be. Everybody with me so far? Yes, yes, okay. It's not a matter of discipline. It's not a matter of willpower. 
those words just make us beat up on ourselves and we don't want to do that. We want to have fun. So here's some of the main habits that people have been able to overcome. All right. What is it about AA that led it to such an unusually high success rate? We're going to take some of the things that they did and then we're going to translate that to habits and systems for our behavior in the market. Okay. They said that some of the things about the AA community that led to unusually high success rate. You can't change the bad habit, but you can modify it. So instead of reaching for a drink, they have the buddy system, where instead you pick up the phone and you call your buddy or your sponsor. Uh, I haven't been in the program, so I don't know exactly uh, the strict terminology in all the interest of disclosure here, but uh, the, the habit serves a purpose. So let's take, for example, the, a person's under stress. They've been down. They've had a bad day. Whatever it may be, let's just deal with the stress. And so their uh, solution to dealing with the stress is drinking that alcohol, and then the net result is they feel relaxed. All right? So the habit serves a purpose. Same thing in your trading. You're nervous, you're anxious, you make a reactive trade, and it let out that tension and uh, stress, okay? Rightly or wrongly, it caused you to make an impulsive thing. So same thing with reaching for a drink. So instead of doing that habit to get to the end goal, the talk on the sponsor alleviates the stress, and then the person feels relaxed. All right, so there's a little loop there. Tension, stress, whatever. Take the action or habit. Net result, you feel more relaxed. Second thing, good support group to help in periods of stress. This is particularly helpful if you have a group of friends or a buddy or a spouse or companion to support you if you're trying to modify your habits, be it in life or in trading. I always believe in trading buddies or having a little small select group. Uh, that's the purpose of my little group that I have online. It's stress relief and we're all there to support each other. Okay. Number three, the belief system. Now with AA, it's not that they're so overly religious, okay, because they say, okay, you've got to submit the fact that God is the higher power. We relinquish the fact that we don't have the power to control our own actions. Therefore, we look to a higher being, all right? You must believe that there is a force out there in the universe to help support you in everything, all right? Next, constant reinforcement, reinforcement. As you make a habit or a changing pattern, it becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. That's why when you do sit about at the end of the seminar to review the things that you want to work on, you don't want to make a list of 10 that you're going to try and nip all in the butt at once. Take one or two easy ones. You'll see how easy it is. You'll start to see the positive results and expectations. All right, and then as that starts to get under control and you build up a little bit of faith and confidence, then you can add one or two more. So to, to the point where perhaps each month you have five things that you're working on, and we're going to go into some good numbers on that. And then lastly, awareness, all right, and that, we're going to get into that. So these notes from the power of habit from the book, all right, increasing your awareness, number one, the importance of identifying when you feel an urge, identifying when you want to go grab something to eat, identify when you're reaching for that mouse and you're just ready to click and make an impulsive trade. Take a note card. All you have to do is do this for one week. Just make a little check mark. Make a little check mark each time you feel the urge to make a trade that is not part of your system, such as pitching something at the low or not putting in a stop or whatever the case may be. Just I make a little check mark. And here's a great example from the book. I'm going to tell you all the book and you won't need to read it, but I do advise uh, recommending it for yourself. There was a girl who had problems biting her nails to the point where she was completely uh, biting down to the quick and they were bleeding and bloody and swollen and absolutely disgusting. But she couldn't stop. All right? It had become such a habit of shoving those fingers into her mouth. And so she was working with somebody on changing this habit and modifying it, which she was able to eventually do through these three simple steps. 
taking a note card every time she felt over the course of the week the urge to bite her nails, she'd make a little check mark. And I think she had like 27 times that week. And she still bit them, but she was at least starting to identify the urges that led up to that impulsive action. Number two, the psychologist has to identify physically what she felt like right before these urges or impulses that caused her to take this action. And she said it was like a little tingling type of feeling, a little energy in her body, and then boom, the hand would go into the mouth. And just start thinking about that in your own behavior during the trading day. What is it that you feel right before you go to open up your email in the middle of trading, right when you shouldn't or you have positions on, or you're going to go make an impulsive trade or do something that deviates from your program. All right. Next, they substituted a behavior. So remember, remember you can't eliminate the behavior, but the psychologist said, okay, next time you start to feel this little tingling or this little urge, I want you to shove your hand in your pocket or grab your arm with your hand. In other words, take some action to alleviate the stress that builds up in your body. So over time, she was able to modify this habit by simply substituting it with another action. So eventually, she'd feel the urge, feel the tingling. Instead of shoving the fingers into the mouth, boom, she grabs her forearm. So think about these three steps with what you identify with your trading. If it is those behaviors that are emotional or reactive or anything that's deviating from your program that allows you to take marginal trades. All right, you see where I'm going? If you do this enough times, the brain will begin to change and create new pathways and you will not feel these same urges. Okay, so now we're going to get down to the fun stuff. All right. The fun stuff is talking about real systems here, real life systems and real systems for changing your behavior. Now, the research says that it takes a minimum of 21 days to change a behavior or make it automatic. Some researchers say it can take up to 80 days. There is no magic number, but what is important for you when you leave this seminar, put some number down for yourself because the brain responds to absolutes. It does not respond to ambiguous gray area. It needs a well-defined number. So if you say, I need to do this for 21 days, and here's what you're going to do. All right, it doesn't have to be 21 days in a row, and we're not going to keep track of the days where we didn't uh, stick to our system. All right. You're only going to keep track of the days where you do positive because the brain also responds to the reward concept. All right? So we're, we're going to, I'm going to give you a very concrete example at the end of this of five systems that I've got here for changing some behaviors that I want to modify. And I'm not going to keep track of the days where I blow it. All right? I'm going to keep track of the days where I, I had a green thing, and I'm going to be looking to make 21 days of green, okay, positive. I don't want to say, oh, I, I, I ate a donut here, and I ate a brownie here, and, I, and I, or I fudged this here, and I didn't go to the gym this day. I don't want to see all these negatives. I want to say, hey, today was a plus day because I got up and I did push-ups for 10 minutes in the morning, or whatever it is that you want to change, all right? So back to when I was on the trading floor. And then I left and uh, started trading upstairs, all right? Initially, if you think about the options arbitrage, we had specific little names for patterns, which, of course, I know all of you are familiar with. The butterfly, a calendar spread, boxes, okay? Call spreads, ratio spreads, all kinds of stuff, straddles. So you learn to think in these types of terms. One word is a very powerful branding or response. So step one more step ahead. Little systems in the market that make an impression. Let me tell you about burning dog. That certainly makes an impression, right? Burning dog. Burning dog was simply the little pattern that we gave to our system when there's a gap in the S&Ps of more than four points. And what we did is we modeled the statistics around this, 
and of course they, they vary with the uh, market's average true range of volatility, but burning dog is when the S&Ps gap up or down by more than four points. The odds are 66% of the times you will get a trade back into that gap, and if you don't get a trade into that gap by more than four points, you're going to make a lower low in the afternoon session, usually off of that 15-minute chart. So if you think about today's action, we gap down four points or lower. We only traded two or three ticks up off the opening price. We did not get burning dog, and so we modeled out what happens when you don't get burning dog in the first hour or two. Well, then the odds are that you'll get a continuation pattern down on the 15-minute time frame. This morning, we, we actually got that in the Dow. It made a lower low, and of course, the S&Ps made a higher low. But this is a little model where all we have to do is say one word, burning dog, and instantly it evokes a simple set of rules for allowing us to put things together in a framework. How many of you have heard of aberration? Aberration has been a trend-following system that's been around for over 30 years, probably one of the most renowned trend-following systems out there. It works off a, a standard deviation function uh, to enter into a trade, has a pretty poor win-loss ratio, as do all trend-following systems. All right, but then it's going to catch that outlier and stay with it for a good enough time, and it's got one heck of a track record going back 30 years. Aberration. What a great little catchy name. Doesn't that make an impression on you? Turtle Soup. That was from the Street Smarts book. It became a joke, a tongue-in-cheek joke, about when the market makes new 20-day highs or lows, suckering in trend followers. All right, of course, we don't know if they're selling there or not. It was just a little joke around the 20-day highs or lows. But it's certainly going to increase our awareness about these pivot points, just like we had in the EC today, just like we had in the Russell today. Turtle Soup. So you see the power of having a branded name. Cinderella Electric Curfew, I'll tell you, does that stick in your head? This is one that I use that I'm going to share with you that I actually stole from another website that made an impression on me. The point is the best systems have three main features here. Actually, I listed a couple more. I listed five. All right, They must be easy to maintain. You can't have a system, you can't have a trading system that has 10 rules. You can't have a trading system that has if this and that or this, but then this filter, but if it does this, then we pull the stop here, oh, scale out of half, that's not going to be manageable. And even if you try programming something like that, ultimately if it has too many variables or parameters, you've succeeded in data mining. All right? Systems need to be simple and they need to be easy to maintain. They need to have a catchy little name or brand because that's going to make an impression on the brain. All right? It must be simple and it can't take up time. All right? I don't want to have a system that governs my behavior where I'm doing checklists all day long. That's not going to happen. I'll walk away from it. I'll do it two days in a row and then I'm out of there. So it's got to be manageable. All right? And in the long run, it has to be something that improves things. In other words, if I have a system for a certain behavior in the marketplace, it's going to be pleasurable because I know that it's going to be a safety net for me or it's going to help me alleviate stress, all right? So shoot for that 21-day number and let's get on and look at some actual systems here, both of everyday systems. I'll give you some examples of uh, some that I found on the Internet here and then I'm going to share with you some systems that uh, may help uh, actually uh, set stuff in a framework. So number one, some examples here of everyday systems. No S diet. All right. This is to solve the problem of being overweight. No S. Very, very simple. No sweets, no snacks, and no seconds on all days except days that start with an S. How easy is that? That's your diet. No sweets, no snacks, no seconds, except on Saturdays or Sundays, the weekends, of course. You're free to do what you want. That should be something that is manageable, doable, easy, and in the long run is going to help bring results. Very simple. Another system, shovel glove. 
these are not my names, these are somebody else's names, shovel glove. These were originated by a fellow who's a computer programmer, a very bright fellow, who found himself sitting in front of the screen 20 hours a day and ending up quite slovenly, even though he was married, he started getting fatter and fatter and having no life and not spending time with family. Gee, guys, does that sound familiar to any of you out there? Hmm, okay. So his system was the NOS diet, shovel glove. All right, he wanted to do some type of exercise that was manageable, wasn't going to take up a lot of time, but was fairly close to a natural action. So his shovel glove system was, he went and bought a sledgehammer at the hardware store, wrapped it up in a sweater so it was relatively soft, for 14 minutes a day. He, he did his shovel glove exercises, either a milking action or rowing action or hoeing action, things that would have been natural action for man 200 years ago. And he could do them anywhere, any room, any time, as long as he did 14 minutes a day. That was the shovel glove system. Easy to remember, makes you feel good, doesn't overly restrict anything, voila. His glass ceiling. That was for his problem drinking. He, didn't, he wasn't an alcoholic, but glass ceiling was no more than two drinks, period. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's more to it than that. And then here's the good one, Cinderella Electric Curfew, and I adopted this one. Cinderella Electric Curfew simply means all the switches are out at midnight. In his case, in my case, 1030. That means I don't have to shut the computer off but the lights get turned off, the TV gets turned off, everything, so that I'm in bed by 1045. Or it actually ends up being a little bit by 11. All right, so those are just some examples here of manageable systems. I'm going to give you a website. You can go, you can create your own systems, and there's a little uh, tracker there where you can just simply uh, take uh, three or four systems, and you can put in a red if you didn't follow the system that day, or a green if you did. Your goal is to do 21 days. Simple, right? Okay. I hope you're still sticking around. <laughs> no sex. You can have sex. Just make it into your own system, right? Okay. And besides, who needs the lights on for that anyway? You can do, uh, you can do that when you have the electric curfew. It'll probably uh, make it happen more often. All right. Systems for, for changing trading habits. That's where we want to drive. I've, I've built you the foundation of how important this is. I've built you the foundation of how this rules our life. I've built you the foundation as to how uh, this is going to hold you back in your trading, regardless of what other systems and technicals and goodness knows what you've had. It's going to be your own actions that are going to be your own undoings. So we want to find a way to change those so that you're not spending thousands of dollars paying a trading coach without ending up with the net result anyway. All right? Here's my systems that I developed for me. Uh, and actually, one of them is for my friend in Switzerland. Cockroach killer. I don't know why I came up with this name, except I was walking down the street one day trying to come up with a name for it, and I was wearing these little uh, kind of uh, Western boots that had a pointy toe, and I thought, you know, uh, I wonder if guys know what cockroach killers are. Cockroach killers are a pointy shoe worn by ladies, and the point was that the point could kill the cockroaches in the corner, all right? So for me, Usually, at the end of the day, I've got at least 45 minutes, sometimes an hour of homework preparation, posting my charts to the website, so forth, so forth. And I'm tired because I get up at 5.30 in the morning. And if it's easy for me to say, ah, I'll do it when I get home, then I cook dinner, ah, oh, let me sit down and watch TV for an hour, and all of a sudden I'm doing my homework at 9 o'clock at night, which is fine, other than the fact that my brain is pretty dead and it's really not making an impression on me. So I came up with my system of cockroach killer, get my homework and nightly preparation done right away so it's out of the way. And if I can do that first, before I open emails or other things, then I can put a little green box in my system. And I know that if I do this 21 days in a row, it will be automatic habit for me. It used to be a habit because I used to send all my homework out on a fax, so it had to get done. And then, of course, uh, it got sloppier and sloppier over the last five years. Number two. The bull weevil system. It's tricky for me because I've got people that work for me, I've got different businesses, uh, so forth. And uh, as try as, a, as I can to have phone calls sent to Sherry or to uh, other offices, uh, you know, I, I get interruptions and, and, and it breaks my concentration and it's a distraction. 
So the, all, the bull weevil is all these little distractions. Yes, I have to call this person back. Yes, I have to get this sent off to somebody. Yes, I promised I'd sign this. Whatever the case may be, guess what? It can all wait till lunch. Because the first two or three hours of the trading day are when the opportunity is, 90% of the time. So that was the little bull weevil system. So if I don't check anything and I don't bother uh, dealing with any of the outside world in any way, shape, or form to lunchtime, then I got a green box in my system. Okay. The pat trade. This was actually for uh, Spieler, my friend in system uh, in, in Switzerland. He said, you know, I said, Spieler, what are your worst habits? He said, you know, I, I just don't stick with the winning trades. I take my profits too early, and uh, and sometimes I see stuff that I, I, I just don't take. So I said, okay, we'll come up with a system. Pat system. Patience trades. Okay. So in other words, if you feel that urge or impulse to take off a trade when it's still working and you really haven't given it a benefit of the doubt, for example, you're saying, oh gosh, you know, the, the yen should go back up and retest this high today, blah, 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 and you put the trade on, and then sometimes you just get impatient or whatever, and you're like, ah, I'll just take it off. That's, that's deviating from your, your system, and you need these good statistical, uh, repeatable patterns to build up the numbers. Okay, same thing like with those three bar breakouts. You know, you need to let the, the market do its thing, and that takes a, a certain leap of faith and confidence that in the long run, the numbers are all going to work out. And if it doesn't, well, that's one of the, the losses, but you need to follow your program in order to have that positive expectation. So the PAT system was simply, if you feel that urge to take the trade off, all you've got to do is count for 60 seconds. Just give it one minute. It's like that impulse to go eat a cookie, okay? If you can resist that urge for one minute, same thing if you're a smoker and you want to go light up or you want to go have a drink. If you can just resist that urge for one minute, once you make it through one minute, then make it through one more minute. You get it? Okay, it's just putting it in a little framework. The, the, the uh, last one here, ABC system, okay, you see a pattern, you say the pattern, at least just put on one, one contract, right? My friend over in Switzerland has a line of, of uh, he can trade 1,000 boons at a clip. He's yet to do that. He says he can't even trade 250, but he's got a backer and a big account, and the guy's really, really, really good. And I said, well, well Spieler, what's happening is you're freaked out by the size. I said, you don't have to trade your full line all the time. You maybe only trade a full line one-tenth of the time. So it has to become automatic before you can build up size, before you're freaking yourself out. I said, so, so just do the ABC. You see the pattern, say it out loud, click on the mouse for a one lot. So it becomes all automatic, and you start doing that over and over, and guess what? Over time, then you'll be doing it on 100, then 200, and you can slowly work up your size. Right, but nothing's going to happen if you're just sitting there sucking back because you know you're intimidated by the risk or the size or whatever, and it's not even his money. So it's uh, and he's been doing this for 15 years. So you see, you see the basic approach how you can take some of these everyday systems that govern our behaviors and habits in other areas and start thinking about your trading. All right, I promise you that these things will fix your bottom line much more so than any other technical whatsoever. Okay. Lastly, I want to say, consider a system to deal with decision fatigue. All you have to do is go onto the internet and Google decision fatigue. And you will see a fascinating piece of research, a wonderful article that does some scientific studies about uh, how a, a judge who was granting prisoners a reprieve would more often grant them the reprieve in the morning than in the afternoon. There was a behavior pattern on the parole board's decisions, but it had nothing to do with the individual cases and it had everything to do with timing. They looked at thousands of decisions over the course of a year, year after year. Prisoners who appeared early in the morning received parole about 70% of the time, while those who appeared late in the day were paroled less than 10% of the time. That's pretty astounding, isn't it? I love studies that are based on huge sample sizes. All right, so this decision fatigue helps explain why 
we don't make as good choices in the afternoon, why we make sloppier trades or people's win-loss ratios go down in the afternoon, they become more reckless, they become more impulsive, all right? Not even thinking about uh, what's happening, okay? It's a phenomenon called ego depletion. And I'm not even going to begin to go there. I'm going to let you Google this article for yourself. It's in the New York Times. So you could just simply Google Decision Fatigue New York Times. And you can read it and draw your own conclusions. But I actually had a friend who refused to make trades in the last hour of the day. The reason being his style, first of all, was much more counter trend. And that's not a great thing to do, try and fade the trend in the last hour of the day. And number two, his, his win-loss ratio was terrible in the last hour. So his system was, don't trade in the last hour. See? Simple. All right. So you guys can uh, Google that. And uh, whoops, let me just go back up here. So your steps. Create a plan. Create a plan for which behaviors you want to deal with. Start off with one. Maybe increase it to three or four. Next, bring out the little note cards to increase your self-awareness. Simply make a little check mark. Don't make it complicated. Don't make it sell spreadsheets. Oh my God, you know. Grab a piece of scrap paper and just scribble a little X during the day if you feel yourself starting to do it because all you're doing is increasing your awareness. Number three, change your environment. If your system is not to trade in the last hour of the day, for Pete's sakes, walk out of the office or disconnect your mouse from the computer. All right? Put obstacles in your way. All right? If your, your system is not to eat sweets or sugar, Get the damn stuff out of the house. If it's not to drink, get the damn stuff out of the house. All right? Change your environment to make it easier on yourself. Next, involve others. I encourage all these traders. You guys, this is a lonely field. On one hand, you don't want to be in a chat room blabbing with 400 people and listening to a zillion others' opinions. That's not the whole point. That's just going to add noise. All right? You can't trade unless you think and see and feel the stuff for yourself. Now, a lot of times all this noise gets in your way. You know, I don't listen to the TV. I don't read other people's research. I do have a little online forum, but it's very small and private, and it's just, uh, you know, it's just more for the humor and a little nervous tension. It's not like I care what anybody else thinks. But I have a few friends, and I'm like, argh, you know, if I bitch about frustration or just joke around or something like that, it serves my purpose. It's my little small community, and I do that for myself. And then lastly, the record keeping, record keeping. It does not have to be onerous, all right? If you make it too complicated, you're not going to do it. Start simple. I, I do believe it helps to write down your trades in the beginning. I do believe it helps to keep track of statistics. I do, but, but really, if it's just simply making a little green box on a day that you did good, that's better than anything. If you make it too complicated, you're not going to do it. All right, so I thought this was really pertinent. I love, I love, Tar I love Gartley, okay? Uh, I, I love Wyckoff the best of all, you know? Uh, but I, I always like to bring up little tidbits here that sometimes uh, strike, strike me. Sometimes if I catch myself uh, doing something I shouldn't do. Uh, this is the difference between a chartist and a technician, okay? Uh, a chartist, he actually should be a chartist versus a trader, okay? A chartist is one who insistently expects the market to confirm to a preconceived pattern, while the technical student is one who realizes that although history can repeat itself, it never does so exactly. So in our forecasting, which is a dangerous game for a trader, the chartist dogmatically concludes that a given development is to take place, all right? It's never a given in the market. It's only one moment at a time. Stay in the present, one swing at a time, while the technical student or the trader, knowing that he's dealing in probabilities, suggests that a development is probable, but you still got to take place before it's considered certain. And lastly, the chartist sets the course of his ship towards this point objective and blindly proceeds on his voyage and the technical student steers his course to keep in fair weather and avoid storms, meaning risk control. So what happens when we get into the markets and you start seeing a major event like we had today or the past two days where the Russell started rolling back down, you know, the weeklies are looking toppy, blah, 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 oh my goodness. Boy, do the bears come out of the woodwork, and you start hearing these projections. Oh, we're going to 1820. Oh, we're going to, to 1760. Oh, let's see, a 10% correction down would be blah, 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 blah. 
right? That's, that's not what trading's about, right? To stay in the moment. And how many times, too? I mean, I, I find myself, it's like, wow, here's this huge uh, point and figure count. Uh, look at this. Wow, it could project up to here. You know, if gold makes an upside breakout or a downside breakout, it could project up to here or there. Rough guideline only. What are the odds it'll actually happen? Maybe 40%. I know that from experience. If the thought crosses my mind, usually it won't happen, okay? It automatically kills it. The stuff that we never think about is the stuff that goes far beyond where we think it can, all right? So always come back to trading. Stay humble. Stay in habits that keep you dealing with the present, okay? That's so important. One step at a time. Don't listen to other people's stuff. Do your own work, all right? And now, because you stuck this out, I'm going to give you something fun to play with. Okay, and I'll also show you that other little three-bar system. Very simple little, uh, simple tool. This idea came from Gartley's book in 1935 called Profits in the Stock Market. Good one to have in your library. As with all these great books, probably 20 pages out of 500 are going to have the most value for you. But it's worth paying the money for those 20 pages. That's what I found. So I was scrolling in the very back of his book towards the appendix, and he was talking about net change oscillators, different types of net change oscillators. As you know, probably one of the primary uh, technical tools or indicators that governed a lot of my trading and dovetailed with this Taylor's trading technique was the two-period rate of change. So I'm like, hmm. I've seen this a zillion times, you know, net change oscillators from uh, people in the 30s, 40s, 50s. Let me just review what he says about them because everybody thinks about Gartley in terms of volume, what he contributed with his volume work or his funny little goofy patterns, uh, you know, the Gartley butterflies, this, that, whatever. Okay, I don't even look at that stuff. But, um, but I thought, oh, let me just see, you know, net change oscillator is looking at, you know, a one period rate of change or a five period rate of change. I like two period rate of change. And you can do all kinds of really neat little tricks on these, like draw trend lines through them. You'll see channels on these net change oscillators. And they're just a confirmation that you get a, 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 a change in momentum. They're really of most value at the end of market swings looking for the loss of momentum and the impulse in the opposite direction or the breaking of the channel on the net change oscillator. And of course, often then price confirms it. In other words, it might be a little slight leading edge on a net change oscillator. So I was looking at his stuff and he's talking about uh, the difference between percentage net change and actual net change and blah, blah, blah. And then he mentions net change oscillators off of moving averages. I thought, hmm. I don't think I've ever really played around with that that much. So what you see right here, this is pretty cool, is a net change oscillator on a 20 period moving average. Big difference between a simple moving average and an exponential moving average. I recommend a simple moving average and I know that's what they used 80 years ago and 100 years ago because it was far too complicated to calculate the exponential moving averages without the computers anyway. But for example, Charles Keltner, who was one of the first that designed a lot of systems, did it with 10 period simple moving averages, all right? So this is pretty cool. I just thought, ah, you know, I don't know what Gartley used, what moving average he did, but I threw this up on there. I'm like, well, look at that, a timely sell signal for our webinar today. So I thought that was just a little fun, a little aside, uh, you know, to make it back, uh, back to the hunt. Uh, okay, yeah sounding board right I'll just go back I'll just go back to the beginning and I'll show you that little uh, three bar breakout pattern because it's always fun to take home uh, one or two more things in your arsenals and for most of you that are market profile people and I know there's a lot of market profile people uh, on Big Mike's site uh, I'm sure you've heard that phrase a balance a three bar balance area that's just basically you see here Three bars price overlap, three bars price overlap. I, in particular, like it where the high is the lowest high of the two days and the low is the highest low of the two days. It doesn't have to be a perfect inside range day by any means. Here you can see the high was above that high on this sugar chart. And like anything, maybe only 10% of them lead to a big win like sugar did. Okay, but that's the game of statistics. You never know which are going to be the little crummy ones that don't get very far 
or which are going to be the big ones that do go far. It's just staying in the game. And that's the beautiful thing about having a system or a structure, be it for your habits, for your everyday life, or for the technicals in the markets. It gives you a certain freedom and peace of mind in knowing that you have a program or a course of action to follow because it is extremely stressful having to make decisions every minute of the day in everything that you do, like what you're going to cook for dinner, for example. And that's why we revert back to habits. Okay? It alleviates the stress from this constant uh, having to make decisions. You're just going to revert back to what's easiest and best in habits. You see? Okay, so I know that a lot of you, okay, I'll just repeat the three bars. This is, this is a daily candle chart, and in fact, I'll tell you where I first got this, this three-bar triangle, if you will, definition, and it was actually from Richard Dennis, not that I knew him personally, but I had a friend who was one of his um, first turtles in his first classes. He's one of the lesser known ones. And when Richard Dennis taught his original turtle course years ago to his selected uh, people who were more apt towards uh, game theory, he, he picked people with a very strong bias for people that would be successful that had a background in game theory or numbers and statistics. All right. So what was interesting is that they all took notes on the turtle system, and of course you saw one of those people publish some of those notes a little early, which he wasn't supposed to do. But in it, it was very interesting because Richard Dennis was not teaching a mechanical system per se. Of course he had some guidelines and parameters, okay, by the 10 day, 10 week high or by the 4 week high, you know, exit at the, you know, the 7 day low or whatever the case may be. Yes, there were some uh, fairly rigid rules to trade around, and he had some rules for position sizing based on the average true range. But what was really fascinating that didn't come out through the history was that maybe 90% of the content that he taught was discretionary, and it all had to do with add-on points or pattern recognition for increasing leverage or game theory where perhaps you wanted to do much smaller size. For example, if you just had one big win, what are the odds that the next trade is going to be a big win? Much more remote, okay? So you'd want to do lower leverage. And where, where Dennis was really good and where the turtles that followed his, uh, his practice did exceptionally well was adding to the winning trades and staying with them. So he identified what he called structural points in the market. For example, a structural point could be if you had a hammer on a daily chart, it leaves a big tail, if you will, a price rejection tail. But what happens if that tail is then taken out? You see, for example, today in the Russell, we left a tail, a buying tail, if you will, a little spike low, and we came back up. But what happens if that tail is now taken out? It would be a superior place to add to a short position, according to Richard Dennis. So these little three-bar triangles, okay, I'm looking at them here in a, in a counter-trend uh, manner for three of these examples, but you can see the boons in the lower left, when they made an upside breakout from that three-bar triangle, which was, you see the high here, the two-day high, and the two-day low, and then this little inside range type of bar. It wasn't an inside day, all right? but it forms this three-bar balance area. And so Richard Dennis called these three-bar triangles, and he would add on the breakout of those. So that's where I, um, I borrowed his jargon, if you will. And then when we did our modeling, what I do is I model and I test for what are the odds that we'll have continuation the next day. I'm only testing for one day. And this pattern, better than NR7s, inside range days, any of these types of things, this pattern had the best statistics for follow-through. So that's where that came from. I hope you didn't lose audio. Everybody okay? Yeah, we're good. All good. All right. Okay, so that kind of sums it up here, guys. 
uh, I don't want to belabor any point. I know that you guys have questions, and uh, uh, you know uh, you get the main idea. You've got three resources. Let me just repeat these resources. Number one, Power of Habit, Charles Duhigg. Okay, get that book if you're not so fortunate to uh, get it today. You can also Google on the internet Power of Habit. Number two, Google that article on decision fatigue. New York Times, great insight. Lastly, go to a website called Everyday Systems. This guy went crazy doing tons of little podcasts and episodes. I haven't read them all. I just kind of stole some of his ideas. He's got a little calendar on there. Very easy for you to put in your own little tracking system. Takes two minutes. Takes two minutes to call it up and do it each day. If you can't do that, there's nothing wrong with taking a piece of paper, just putting out a little calendar and giving yourself a little gold star on some days. And remember, we don't care about the days where it fails. We only care about the winning trades. And all you want is 21 winning days. Even if it takes you three months, just go for getting that 21 winning days. All right? Okay, gang, I've got time for questions. Let's go for it. <laughs> anything, okay. anything under the sun. Okay, so everybody can type their questions in. And then, uh, Linda, uh, on the 10 books we're giving away, uh, how do you want to do that? You, do you have 10 questions or five questions? How do you want to do it? I will give you a list of five questions, and uh, uh, then if, if we need more questions, I can do that. Okay, five's fine. We could, we could do two books per question. So. Okay. All right, so I see questions coming in, so have at it. My opinion of selling premium, either naked or spreads. Okay, I got smacked once and it took me five years to pay it off. Uh, I think it's a stupid game, so I don't sell premium. I like to get bang for my buck. I want to see where are the spots in the market that I can get the most amount of dollars for the least amount of time being in the market. The problem with selling premium is that you have to be in the market constantly till you wait for that little crap to decay. Okay, so every day, every minute that you're in the market, you have risk. That's the problem with selling premium. And it, it, it ties up your hands and, is flexi and, and your flexibility. So, uh, uh, you know, my first nine years of trading as an option seller, I, uh, I, I pretty much was short premium all the time. And I'm sure it chopped off a uh, good 10 years off of my lifespan. I don't do it anymore. When I have buy signals at the same time in correlated markets, like for example the grains, how do I decide which signal to take? Okay, you've got two options. A, take the first one that comes along, or B, split up your leverage, do half on one, half on the other. Uh, you just want to be mindful of your total correlation or exposure overall. Sometimes I have a better feel for one market or the other. Can I elaborate on concentration? Absolutely. Concentration is dependent on your physical state, okay? So eat well, eat clean, physical exercise, anything that you can do, get better sleep. So physical first is very important for concentration. Also, concentration is something that you can build up with over time. So if you can concentrate for 15 minutes, then stretch it out. See if you can concentrate for 30 minutes, right? Don't set insurmountable goals for yourself because you'll always fail. You want to set up little goals, little targets that you can succeed at. All right, concentration for me is something that was very easy because I, I was a pianist and I used to have to practice and sit in front of the piano and I had a closed room, no distractions, no television, uh, you know, none of these things. That's when you concentrate best is when you have no distractions. God forbid they ever invented the internet. That's the biggest detriment to concentration ever. And email and texts and little dings on your phone and goodness knows what. So if you want to improve your concentration, find a way to eliminate those things. All right? Uh, that's, that's, that's all I can say about that. And then start small. I mean, most people, for me at least, I could concentrate very well. And then the last couple of years, you know, you have this obligation and that obligation, and it starts to become a real battle. So, uh, you know, I have to isolate myself. I make sure there's no TV in the room. I make sure there's uh, no, no people walking in to talk to me or anything like that. And that's how I have to deal with it. So find your own solutes. Just be aware of it. In terms of Wyckoff books, 
The best thing you can do is go onto the internet. There's so much free material. Read the stuff put out there by Hank Pruden. He's probably the world's best Wyckoff aficionado, and he can boil down a lot of the uh, essence and concepts uh, that Wyckoff put together. Uh, other than that, there is a course that you can buy. I think it's $1,000. Uh, it's, it's Wyckoff's original course. Uh, the, the, uh, you'll just have to Google it on the internet. Uh, it's an exercise. I, I bought the course years ago and I probably completed 10% of it. You know, uh, I tried to just pick out the pertinent parts. It's definitely worthwhile and there's a lot of people that have written about Wyckoff that can boil down his essence. So um, that, that's what I've got to say there. What is my LBR flag pattern that Fairy Hamzi is so fond of? I have no frickin' idea, okay? The problem with, with flags, yes, they're a very valid continuation concept, but if you truly look at the markets, there's a heck of a lot of noise, all right? So what happens is, if you actually tried to program these things, you'd find that it would be worthless because the market's going to pick up the noise. Be aware of other people cherry-picking crap after the fact, all right? It doesn't mean anything. A bull flag or a bear flag, it's classic technical analysis. Do it in trending markets that are making higher highs and higher lows. Don't look for flags in trading range markets. I mean, it's, it's like uh, something Schabacher and Edwards and McGee and all those guys wrote about years and years ago. I don't take credit for anything. And you're, it, it's, it's a misjustice if people are pointing this crap out after the fact and cheery picking good stuff that works. All right? Don't listen to that stuff. I don't take credit for anything. For S&P trading, which tick charts do you use? Like one minute or several time frames. Okay, keep in mind, guys, that your software is going to produce different tick charts than somebody else's software. So, for example, think or swim. If I use a 5,000 tick chart, it might look different from a 5,000 tick chart on CQG or TradeStation. And the reason is because some servers drop off packets in high volume markets, there could be all kinds of little reasons as to why. So pick what makes sense to you. I like finding something that's kind of approximate to like a four or five minute chart and a 15 minute chart. If you try to trade on too short of a time frame, trust me, you'll just get chopped up in the noise. You really want to get the main idea right and you're doing yourself a disservice to go down to where you're only seeing the trees and not the forest. It's very difficult. I mean, I remind myself all the time. I have yet to see anybody make a heck of a, of a decent living on five-minute charts, okay? The people that I know, and I've been doing this for like 34 years, you know, I, I've, I've seen uh, floor traders, I've seen fund managers, I've seen professionals, I've seen everybody under the sun, all right? You're not going to make a living scalping off of little charts, little five-minute charts. You have to figure out a way that you can, at least part of the time, capture a good piece of the trend for the day. And then the little five-minute charts and the little tick charts and so forth are your road signs along the way, right? So I want to plot a course. How am I going to get from Chicago to Florida, all right? I'm going to look at the daily chart. I'm going to look at the hourlies. What's the overall structure, okay? What's my roadmap to get from Chicago to Florida? But then I'm going to be mindful along the way of the little five-minute charts and little, uh, little inter in market internals and so forth, like, ah, do I need to go left or do I need to go right? Do I need to stop and refuel? Do I need to take a break and so forth and so forth? That's the importance of little short time frames. They just help with initial trade location but they're not a good tool in and of themselves to be solely dependent on. So start with your analysis. What's the trend for the day? How many days have we always been high to low? Okay, coming in today, the Russell had already had two big days high to low. Today was the third day. Is it going to close on its lows on the third day of a high to low day? The odds are probably not. All right, so then you can start to watch the little 5 or 15 or whatever for loss of momentum or whatever the case may be. So just keep that in mind. Do I think scalping tits with order flow is a plausible way to make money in the S&Ps? Let me repeat. I have yet to see anybody buy a million dollar house off of scalping S&Ps off of order flow. Yes, it's fun. Yes, it's novel. It may be a valid tool, absolutely. 
you're dealing with a very, very short time frame, and you're missing the whole idea about getting the main idea right, guys. All right, so I, I don't use that. I, I've looked at everything under the sun. And candle volume, order flow, market delta, blah, 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 blah. It's like the market's going up or the market's going down. If the market's going to stop going down and you're going to get divergences in order flow or whatever the case may be, you're going to see it on oscillators. You're going to see it on the bar charts. Everything's correlated. I think it's far more important to make sure of the non-confirmation between the indices. So, for example, how could the S&Ps have done well yesterday or the day before when the Russell was falling out of bed? And then today when the Russell wasn't going down anymore because it was oversold, the Dow could only push down so far. All right, so everybody picks their tools. They need to be supportive tools, all right? They need to be supportive. In the world of Gartley, okay, some of the things that he said is that there is no one absolute indicator. All right, it's, it's, it's all an art, not a science, but it takes a lot of combination of studying and putting things into a context, and, and some things will work differently in bull markets, and some things will work differently in bear markets. So that's my two cents with all that stuff, uh, order flow and, and so forth. I, I, I want to see who's making money out there and who's making good money out there, all right? And then I'll, and then I'll draw my conclusions off of that. Okay, my buddy next to me day trades five minute charts on stocks and averages 100k a month. Can be done. But he's specialized and he's good and he's got uh, good reflexes and he's not trying to do so many things at once. He's just looking at probably momentum stocks, a little bit of an organic holistic flow, and absolutely it can be done. But I'll tell you, I'm, I'm talking about the futures and, and uh, I, I would just say for the, the majority of people, if you try to trade too short of a time frame, you're going to get chopped up in the noise, especially if you're newer. There are people that can sit there and day trade the heck out of things, but they've been doing it for a while. You're not just going to start off doing that, and they probably have very, very, very good habits. What's my opinion of market profile in trading? I think market profile is a fabulous, fabulous tool for explaining concepts. The people that I know that do best with market profile tend to only use market profile and just one or two markets. It's a very difficult tool to use across 15, 20 different markets. So for me, I'm usually trading 15, 20 different markets, not all at the same time, but they're in my stable, if you will. And I, you know, because I like to look for the, the three bar breakouts or certain patterns or, or certain things in the S&Ps. And, and I find that for myself, I just can't use it. You know, it, it's great at explaining concepts. I love the concept of trend day. I love the concept of breakouts from the little nice tight little profiles. I love that pattern. You can see the same thing in the bar chart there. Uh, you know, if you're not as good with it, I find too that a lot of people will see what they want to see in that. All right, because it's not black or white, it's not absolute. So if you find that it's not working for you, don't hit your head against the wall. All right, I find that it only works for a small percentage of people, but it's a great, great, great tool. It's auction theory. Uh, if it works for you, great. Uh, I don't use it in my own uh, trading, but I have certainly uh, lectured on it and, and will look at it at night, looking for the little tight profiles of the three bar balance areas because it's all the same thing. You know, you're pushing out of this high volume node. So if you look at my screen and you see all of these three bar breakouts here, okay, I could show you if you were to look at a volume profile. In fact, I, I, I bet you I could just throw something up here for fun. Uh, let me put something up here if you want to see something fun. This is uh, CQG. All right, so you see here, this is a chart of, of silver, and I think I have a 10 bar look back here, and you can see the volume node. So this is an extremely popular concept now as well. All right, let's just see what the S&Ps look like today. I'll take a second to pop up uh, the, the little volume on it. But, but seeing where that volume is, that's a, 
There you go. Look at that. Right back down into that home. I'm sure that those of you that have uh, looked at this on the bigger time frame, that 62 to 64 area, now this is just a pit session chart, but if I look at the 24-hour session, 62, 64, have been a high volume node. So just understanding the basic principles that the market's either moving away from these high volume nodes or it's gravitating back towards them is one of the important concepts with market profile. It's just that there's a million ways to skin a cat. You know, you can uh, do it a million ways, but uh, it's certainly, certainly of value. Uh, is there a correlation in non-correlated markets that can be used with crude oil? Hey, guys, you know what? I could sit here and talk for five hours. This is fun, uh, but maybe I'll have to schedule another time to do all this uh, because we do have to give away books. But let me just say this about correlations. They work till they don't work. I've seen gold positively correlated with the dollar for a year and a half, and I've seen gold inversely correlated with the dollar for a year and a half period. If you want to look at correlations, do yourself a favor. Go to Steve Moore's website, mrci.com. Free research on there. You can check the correlations with every market. Not only that, correlations are dependent upon the look back period. So you can see, how is it correlated over a 30-day look back? How is it correlated over a 60-day look back? How is it correlated over a 120-day look-back period? You guys remember when the yen was 95% correlated with the bonds? Actually, I think it was about 92%. The yen was 92% correlated with the bonds until it wasn't. And then the yen fell out of bed, and the bonds actually had an upside bias for a good year there. So correlations work till they don't work. For me, they're not a very great trading trading tool. You just want to be aware of it in your leverage and overall market exposure if the positions happen to be correlated at that time. All right. For day trading, 15.30 hourly charts. Yeah, all of them. Day trading, five minute. I love five minute charts of the S&Ps. I don't mean to slam them. I'm just saying that put them in the holistic organic context. Five, 15, 30, 120 minute. There you go. I love them all. What platform am I using? I have three platforms that I use. I love TradeStation. They can do fabulous analytics on radar scan. Just one of the best for researching and back testing and all that kind of stuff. Just fabulous. Love TradeStation. Uh, this one here that I showed you, that's CQG. I always have to have two platforms because uh, backup, backup, backup for me. So I use CQG for my primary and TradeStation. And then for my execution platform, I use the uh, Photon Trader. Uh, for it just just those futures, uh, that, that's fine, and uh, uh, so so that that's it in a nutshell. Correlation website mrci.com. Just for kids, I'm just going to call this up, and then we're going to do our questions and uh, take it from there. So let me just show you something really cool because uh, you know you guys are very enthusiastic. MRC, more research. Okay, go down here free futures research and it'll say S&P correlations go down to intermarket correlations see that and here's your grid and it'll show you what every market is correlated with every market so for example right now the EC is 98 percent correlated with the Swiss franc shock okay there's not any real strong glaring correlations popping out here at this time. If I had looked at this three years ago, you would have seen the Canadian dollar 92% correlated with the S&Ps. What is that now? 90, it's negative correlation. Okay, so you just saw uh, Canadian dollar and the S&Ps were 92% positively correlated uh, for well over a year, and now they're minus 77% correlated. You see? So just now, but if I do a, if I I do a 90-day look back, wow, it's changed. All right, now you have a, a mild positive correlation. Let me just say this, statistics. What is the old expression? If you torture them enough, you can make them lie about anything. All right, statistics can also be your greatest disservice. Okay, they can also be your greatest disservice because where does the opportunity come from in trading? The outliers, the aberrations, the extreme volatility. And that's the thing that statistics don't tell you. They're just going to tell you the mean or the norm. That's what Tlaib was all about. All right. 
So uh, just keep that in mind. I, I think it's a, a big disservice for people that put out statistics out there. There's some free services that like to throw you a little bone every day. And you look at the sample size, and it's got a sample size of 18. I'm like, huh? Sample size of 18, and I'm going to bet money on that? I don't think so. Here's the statistics. You can take something with a sample size of 18 that has a win-loss ratio of 92% past history. Going forward, the win-loss ratio will be 65%. Still an edge, but not as strong as you would think. And the reason is the confidence factor. In theory, you're supposed to have a sample size of 36 to have anything statistically significant. And in my work, the modeling that I do, I find that I need to have a sample size of over 300 to have anything statistically significant. So just beware. Nothing beats common sense and watching the tape. All right? All right, guys. Are you ready? Okay, so we're I'm gonna just going to simply we're ask give away the questions. books. Yeah, and I just okay. want to ask everybody to get their BMT username ready because that's how I'm going to get your mailing address and the autograph request. So have that ready, guys. Let's by the way, I will never comment on anybody else's trading technique because I don't know what the hell it is. All right, <laughs> and I don't want to know what the hell it is. <laughs> I only care about my own shit and whether it's working or not, and if I'm following good habits. And that's how you should be, too. You've got to find your own stuff. And don't believe anybody else's BS unless you've done your own testing and modeling. And don't believe anybody else's BS unless they show you their statements. My statements are all audited going back to 1991 when I first became a CTA. It's recorded with the CFTC NFA type of stuff. All right, and I'll just leave it at that. So it's hard for me to lie. But don't believe others. BS, because it's not about other people. It's about you. It's like bowling or playing golf. I don't care what somebody else's score is. I only care about my own score. And if they give me a little tip, okay, perhaps how to grip the club a certain way if I'm hooking or slicing it, great, that's of value. So if you can pick up something from my webinar or from somebody else's webinar that's of use for you that you can take and integrate into your own methodology, Wonderful. It's a value. I don't even care if they're making money or not, but if they can give me a little tidbit that helps me improve my bottom line, that's the name of the game. So uh, I'll tell you one little thing, uh, a little joke that we had from the trading floor days. Okay, And this is not meant to be directed towards anybody whatsoever, but I, I want you guys to be cynical and skeptical out there because the only thing that matters is your own stuff. All right? And I can tell you back in the days, I was, I was on the floor for like a number of years, two different exchanges and stuff, and we always used to have an expression. There were three ways to tell if somebody was a profitable trader or a not profitable trader, all right? First of all, if somebody was a not profitable trader, they would always have to talk about their winning trades. Why? Because they had so few of them. When they actually made one, they had to talk about it, okay? So be careful about anybody that is bragging about their winning trade. I'll tell you right off the bat, the people that were making the most money in the pits, and for that matter, upstairs were always the ones that were pissing and whining and bitching. Oh, I got stopped. I got a, a tick slippage. Oh, God, they raped me again. Blah, 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 blah. And I mean, all well, the ones that they're up the most at the end of the month, okay? It's like a big old poker face. You don't talk about your hand. You don't talk about your winning trades. Number two, if you're making money, you're not selling stuff. Easy enough. You're not selling indicators. You're not selling courses. You're not selling this or that. You're not selling a billion things on its own. Why? Because I'll tell you, you can make so much more money trading. And you can make so much more money managing money. So be careful about that, all right? I'm not, I'm not even going to go into number three because I don't ever want to say <laughs> negative energy about anybody else. Everybody has their values that they comment on. But you guys, just be, be skeptical, okay? The emperor is not wearing clothes out there, and a lot of people think that, that he is, okay? So anyway, let's go on and do some fun stuff. All right. Let's, let's do it. Do you want me just to... Yeah, just yeah. what's the first question? Stuff? Yeah, so we're, it's five questions total, right? So we're going to do uh, two winners per question. So if you can just keep, uh, you know, monitor the, the questions tab and help me find the right answers. All right. By the way, no, I'm not selling stuff. 
I wrote one book 16 years ago. I get paid five books, five dollars off of every book that's sold. It's a $150 book. The publisher makes the money. I'm never writing another book again. It was way too much work, and it takes way too much time out of trading. I probably could have made millions of dollars selling tons of books. God knows. Uh, Jake Bernstein, I think, put out 30 of them. I, I put out half of a one, and I'll probably never do it. It's just too much work <laughs> for me. So, no, I'm not selling stuff. <laughs> and I never have. You've never seen me advertise. You've never seen me market. You know, I, I have my own... Uh, uh, fund and, and my uh, investors would be chagrined uh, if they saw me blabbing all over the place about stuff. All right. Anyway, question number one. What is burning dog? Ah, four-point gap. There we go. Yes, the two first four-point gaps. All right four-point gap, and then you see if you can trade into the gap by four points. It's got to be four points or more. Okay, so Sam S. and Joe Flanagan, uh, type your BMT username, please. Do I have time for just a two-minute story here? I'll tell you the real story behind Burning Dog. Sure. Okay, story behind Burning Dog. I actually had a, had a, uh, a fellow that uh, uh, came to hear me talk one time, and it was like right after the 9-11 crash and stuff, and I'm like, God, nobody, you know, nobody wants to hear me talk about anything, you know, so, uh, but I said, well, I'm going to talk anyway, because I always talk for myself, you guys know that by now, right? So, um, he came, and he's like, got tattoos all over his body, muscle shirt, you know, bald, earring, a uh, little, you know, whole nine yards, and I'm like, man, who is this dude, you know? <laughs> and he was very persistent, I'm like, this sucker better be, uh, pretty committed, you know, to show up and, and uh, be uh, uh, all situated like that. He came up to me and he's like, you know, if you ever need any help, I'm available. I'll do anything you want. I'm not stalled, da 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 You know, I'm like, okay, great. I said, how did you get into trading? He goes, well, I've been jackhammering concrete for 20 years. I said, my knees gave out. I just can't do it anymore. So I borrowed $30,000 on my credit cards. Okay, obviously this was uh, well 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when you could do that kind of stuff. And he goes, and now I'm trading. I'm like, geez, oh cripes. So I need some help because I had an assistant that actually was in an accident. And uh, you know, I thought, ah, you know, this guy was pretty, pretty devoted. I said, come on out to Florida. You know, you can uh, uh, stay, in, stay in my house, you know, for a while and, and help me out. And so uh, every time the market would gap up or down, he's like, ah, it's a burning dog. And I'm like, Genghis, that was his, <laughs> that's what we called him. He said, Genghis. What are you talking about, a burning dog? What the hell do you mean? He goes, well, have you ever wanted to pet a burning dog? You know, I'm like, crap, no. What the hell are you talking about, you know? <laughs> I said, a burning dog stinks, you know? It's like, well, who is this wacko guy? You know, man, he's sitting next to me, and he's, like, talking about all these crazy things. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's fading the gap. And I'm like, okay, well, let's, whoa, whoa, whoa. Before, before we get carried away here, let's model this and do some statistics on it. So we went, and we actually did this all by hand back in those days, you know, writing down the gap for each day, and then how much it retraced into the gap, and breaking it down into an average to range function, and so forth and so forth. And so that kind of became our little model. Okay, if the market gaps up by four points or more, what is the percent of the time that you'll get down four points? And it's been a pretty consistent model with the exception of 2008 and so forth when we have a huge expansion in the average to range function and face it, a four point gap is not very significant, you know, when you've got 60 handle ranges, right? So then we took it another step further and this is when Nigel was working for me uh, with TradeStation and doing our modeling. I said, Nigel, what happens if we don't get the four points up or down by, uh, you know, 12 noon? you know, um, Eastern time, and he goes, well, then you've got 65% chance that you'll make new highs or new lows in the afternoon session. I'm like, that's a great little model. And, of course, it's a common sense type of thing, right? You gap, you're either going to get continuation or retracement type of stuff. But it just gave us a little framework to put it around. And uh, so, anyway, that was that was the background. Uh, this, this fellow went on and uh, uh, traded uh, S&Ps uh, successfully, doing his own thing. Uh, very fine, fine, fine fellow. You never judge a book by uh, by their cover. Yeah. Uh, very fine fellow. I have nothing but the greatest respect for him. So anyway, that was the story behind Burning Dog, and it <laughs> stuck. You see the power of that branding? This was like 10 years ago, and to this day, every time that S&P opens, this morning it opened, it was like gap down four points. All right? It's like, Oh, burning dog, you know. <laughs> and so then, but we also have another complementary system that you, uh, as you know, if you're a market profile type of person, and you're looking at that open drive type of concept, 
Okay, we also modeled out what happens if the S&P really doesn't trade more than two or four ticks above or below the opening price in that first 30-minute bar, you're going to get, you know, a trend move. And so uh, now that obviously that first 30-minute bar has kind of become a first 15-minute bar. You know, this, this horse is leaving the barn pretty quickly these days. But anyway, that was a fun little aside. Okay, so that was, um, that was question number one. Question number two, give me three characteristics of a good system. Name three characteristics. There you go. It's got to be simple to maintain, simple and branded. Yes, so Najib, you got that one right on the head. Simple, memorable, easy. There you go. So I need There's you, you too, John Sproul. Okay. Yeah, for both guys. Okay. Who wrote The Power of Habit? Doohig. There you go. I got two doohigs. <laughs> See, you'll remember that one now. It's really inexpensive book. Get it. It's a fun read. It's just fascinating. You know, even if you don't, if it has nothing to do with your trading, I appreciate unique original research. And uh, these guys did some really interesting studies. In addition to that, there's a lot of very practical, uh, good, cool stuff in there that everybody can use. So that's, uh, that's for sure fun. I need uh, David, David Tuff's username and Mark Brockman for the last one. All right. What are the three no S's? The no S diet. There you go. No snacks, no sweets, no seconds. I guess you could say sugar instead of sweets, but it's supposed to technically be sweet, snacks, and seconds. So that's, uh, that's on that Everyday website. Remember, go to that website every day, and you'll see how catchy this is. See how simple this is. See, you guys remembered this. You're right on top of this stuff. So that was uh, Kate Harris and let's see, who's the second it's one? Sweets, snacks, and seconds. So Kate Harris and Sabine. Okay, so Sabine, I need your username and Kate. Sabine Holboth. And I think I'm also still waiting on John Sproul's username. Okay. Okay, we're good. All right. Man, I got I got to come up with uh, I got to come up with one more. Okay. <laughs> Let's see here. I, I, I tell you, you know, my brain at the end of the day. This is what happens. You can't, you can't be running like ten different habits at once. It's, it's impossible, you know. I mean, you'll, you'll get brain fry, fry really, really quickly here. Uh, all right, this one's a give me. Okay, this one's a give me. Cinderella electric curfew. <laughs> no, it's not bedtime per se. It's like turn off the electricity. It's an electric curfew. <laughs> you can still do other activities, guys, in the dark, all right? So it's an electric curfew. <laughs> so I think what Ra Rachel was like Rachel Hart and who who else got it? Lights off. Okay, Jade M. Lights off. Okay, all switches out. Rachel Hart. Yep. Okay, so Jade and Rachel. All if right. I'll get your username. All right. So uh, Linda, as always, I really appreciate it, and I, I found that this topic is really good, and I hope people pay close attention. You know, like you said, everybody is so fascinated with indicators and technical stuff, but this 
this is the stuff that really makes you profitable, you know, it makes you successful is focusing on, on this. It is, and I'll tell you, the, the toughest part is, is that it's really hard to change habits. It's really, really hard, and I actually have to confess, I, I ordered all the books that, that the Alcoholic Anonymous recommends, just trying to research. I'm like, what is it that these guys you know, do, and what is it that's making their program so successful? I mean, they far blow away all the statistics for the, uh, you know, those clinics that people pay $30,000 to check themselves into and this and that, you know. Uh, here's a simple uh, organization for free, basically run by volunteers. It's been around for for decades, you know, it has a phenomenal success rate, and the thing is that people have not, you know, many, many people have not relapsed, you know, and, and this book was talking a lot about it, and I'm like, what is it that they offer, you know, and what is their program uh, that makes it so powerful, because if you've had success in one area, it's always transferable to another area. So you study what made this program successful, and what can I extract and take it to correcting this habit? Overeaters Anonymous, or Over Gambling Anonymous, or Over Trading Anonymous, you know? And uh, so lots and lots of valuable insight and tools and resources for you guys from material that only costs $10 or $15, and a lot of this is for free on the internet. It's just how much do you want to commit to pursuing this? So I gave you some easy, fun, simple ways that don't take much time. Uh, have fun. Uh, you're going to be a lot more conscious over the next week about how you go about making your unforced errors. And again, Big Mike, thank you so much for sure. having me on today. Thank you, Linda. Really appreciate it, and I hope to have you back in a few months. Thanks, guys. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye, guys. You're great.